at AIA Australia. We're making healthy living easier by incentivising your clients with rewards. Like discounts on their gym memberships, eligible flights and insurance premiums with AIA Vitality. It's no wonder that we've reduced client lapse rates by 50% and helped grow client engagement. To find out more, contact your AIA CDM today. You're right, Tom. Welcome, everyone. Welcome, Andrew, and David, Dylan, Ezra, Jessica. All right, Michael. There's plenty of names out there. Um, so let's get kicked off straight away. Let's not waste time. We're going to uh, uh, spend a long time grilling Steve. Just a quick disclaimer. Uh, about two weeks ago, Steve Crawford, our guest, sent me a message saying that X Y Advisor uh, interviews. They need to be a bit more harsh on the interviewee. Uh, we need to kind of grill them and challenge their assumptions a bit more. So that's what we've invited Steve on. And uh, well, it's going to be a little bit more tongue-in-cheek uh, than what the normal interviews are. So just to interview Steve, uh, he is the uh, – what is he? He's a financial coach at Experience Wealth, and he is a teacher at – your spending coach. So, Steve, just kick us off. Explain what the difference between uh, being a financial coach at Experience Wealth is and being a sensei teacher at your spending coach. Uh, thanks, Tomo uh, and Nashi. Uh, and thanks for having me on. And, uh, yeah, I've, I've already given you boys license. There's no taboo, no off limits. I'll do my best to be authentic and try not to offend too many people. Um, but I figure if you don't offend at least one person, you haven't tried hard enough. So, um, We'll see how we go. Look, the main, okay. um, the main difference between a, a financial coach and a, a trainer or a coach at um, spending coach is basically the audience. So uh, in our experience wealth business, which is our, in our XY, I suppose, consumer-facing brand, a, um, traditional financial planning uh, business, mortgage broking business, our clients are 20s, 30s, 40-something-year-old Aussies, um, and so that or we act as their financial planners, but we try to really use the, the term financial coach because we see our role to be more as um, someone that helps them make smarter, more confident decisions around what they do with their money and coach them through that process as opposed to just planning out steps and, or advising and telling them what to do. Um, so that on one side. The other side, uh, at the moment, we have one coaching business called Your Spending Coach when watching another one. Um, in the next month or so called the XY Academy, not to be confused with uh, XY Advisors. It is a completely different business. Um, but in, in our current business of your spending coach, what we do is we teach or I teach other financial, <coughs> sorry, financial advisors and mortgage brokers um, how to help their clients make smarter, more confident decisions around their money, specifically through developing a personal um, spending and savings program that they can roll out for their clients. And I've been doing that for about three years and taught about 220 odd planners and, and um, brokers in that time. Yeah, cool. So, um, you know, this whole session is about attracting a Gen X and Y client. So uh, my first real question is, you know, what is the number one way that you guys at Experience Wealth, so your financial planning business, uh, are attracting Gen X and Gen Y clients? Um, yeah, so I suppose the, the number one way, there's sort, of, there's sort of two things, maybe three things that sort of sit equally first. Um, and this is based on our own uh, anecdotal feedback. Plus, we did a client survey probably about three years ago. We're, we're very much overdue to do another one um, where we asked our clients that were already clients, um, why is it that they came and saw us in the first place? So what either problem did they want to solve or what goal did they want to achieve? But more importantly, why do they come and see us? Two, why do they pay our fees um, on, the, on an initial basis to get help? And then three, um, why do they refer other people in to come and see us? And the um, top three things <coughs> that anecdotally come through, but in the survey came through, was one was goal planning. So helping them sort out their list of crap that they want to do, goals that they want to achieve and actually get off their backsides and do something about it. Um, most of our clients are, and some of our clients come to us with decent savings already. Some of them come to us and they've got really good income and they just want to find a reason to save more of that income and not spend all of it. 
Um, but the thing that everybody seems to have in common is they don't have a process for making decisions around which goals to go for, which ones to park. Um, if they want to blend goals together, how do they actually do that um, in a way so that they don't feel like they're sort of losing something in the process? Um, and so we built a whole process around that, and I'm happy to share details with that, uh, about that later if that's interesting. Um, uh, the second reason was um, money management specifically. So they earn good money. We we'll talked about um, I had a great term in the States from a podcast I was listening to this morning. I've forgotten the lady's name, but I'll get the details. She wrote a book called Pivot. Um, and uh, um, actually, no, it was a different lady. Anyway, lady. Yeah, what does it <laughs> get another book. Um, she talks about um, she has um, high net growth clients instead of high net worth clients. And I think that's a really good way to describe the types of clients that we have. They um, earn good money, probably slightly above average compared to the Aussie average, but not a lot. Um, they have growth aspirations and, and growth goes beyond asset growth. It's career growth first and foremost. It's personal growth. It's relationship growth. Um, and but one of the biggest things that they realise is that they, and it's a common phrase I get all the time we get myself and Chris and Sarah in the business, um, we earn real, I earn really good money. I feel like I should be doing better with it. So having a, a system to help them harness that money and, and make better decisions around it, hopefully increase their savings is the second thing. Uh, the third thing typically stems off property related decisions um, as, a, as a demonstration of a goal, but there's a lot of debt management knowing how to get a home loan the right way, not just what the bank's willing to lend them um, or what a mortgage broker's, you know, pushing them into um, and then understand how to structure the thing off so they can pay it off faster and, and still see what they've got for savings. So those are the three biggest things that why they come in. Um, it's also the three biggest reasons why they pay our fees on an ongoing basis. They've quantified this with us. It's also the three biggest reasons why they refer other people in. So this day eight years down, We've never had a referral for insurance. And the only 98% of our clients have come from client referrals and we started with zero clients. So do the math. Um, it's it's clearly the most important thing from their side. So you talked about, you know, the reason people come to you is, you know, goals-based. Um, so do you still provide advice around insurance to buy investments, uh, even though, you know, your clients are saying that that's not really why we come to you? Are you still providing that advice? Yeah, we do. Absolutely. So this is not dismissing the value of retirement planning um, or protection planning, um, insurance advice or estate planning. It's, um, we absolutely do that. We just don't lead with it. Um, uh, it's there, it's in our service, I suppose, you know, our fee structure, initial plan and then ongoing support. Um, we refer to it as the lifestyle protection plan and retirement plan, not insurance and superannuation advice. Um, it might seem semantic, but we've tried, to, we've tried to, as much as possible, build the business starting from the client and then working backwards to say um, what language do they use when they talk to us. So it's absolutely a, it's a part of what we do. I would argue that we probably deliver risk and super advice if you want to use an industry label in about 90% of the people that we see. There's probably only about 10% of the day takes up in helping them set that up and then keeping it on track. Yeah, so I know, I mean, you just, you mentioned it before, and you know, 98% are referrals from clients. You, you throw that figure around like you're super proud of it, which is, you should be proud of it. I mean, who knows if it's real or not? We don't know your business, but we'll take it as face value. Um, so what do you actually do practically um, to get that referral? Do you have like a system in place to, um, with current clients to try and get their friends and families referred to you? Yeah, we do. And, and look, at, you know, at the end of the day, 98% uh, could be I've got uh, 10 clients and 9.8 of them have come through referrals. So who gives a crap, right? We, we don't have 10 clients. We've got a few more than that, 12. Um, and, uh, but at the end of the day, well, what we identified probably about three years ago, maybe four years ago, um, actually probably a bit earlier, let's go back about six years ago, um, one of the biggest disconnects we had was uh, around the way that we were charging for the advice that we were providing. So we, had, we know we add a lot of value in the budgeting and the cash flow, the personal spending and savings plan space. 
Um, we know we add a lot of value in the goal planning side and we know we add a lot of value in the, um, the debt management, uh, lending structuring type stuff. But we were still collecting our payment from the product. So we were still getting insurance commissions and we we're still doing percentage of asset on our superannuation. And, and I think that was the first recognition of a misalignment of value from the client's point of view, um, right through from where they see the value in what we do how we construct the advice, where we spend our time, and then what they're paying for. So we were getting, um, we, we didn't get a, a large number of referrals um, on, on an early basis per client. And so one of the first things we did was we recognised that not only was the fee structure wrong for a couple of other reasons. One, we'd end up doing the right thing by the client not getting paid where they had industry cover or corporate cover and, and we couldn't get the new policies because they've been built because um, of like mental health exclusions and stuff like that. Um, not only was that the wrong thing to do by us because we did the right thing by the client, it was really hard for the clients to articulate how they charge, how we charge for what we did. So the first hurdle we had to jump was make the fee model simple for them to understand because the, the flow, and we mapped through the client engagement model and said, when you speak to a friend about us, well, one, do you speak to friends about us? And they'd say, yeah, we do. And it's like, where do you do that? And typically it was at dinners, dinner parties and stuff like that where they're in a slightly more social setting um, in a way where they can talk about it for a while but then bin it when they don't want to talk about it. And it's always about the stuff that they're um, looking for help with. So, it, and, and it's something that we've previously helped them with. So buy the property, start a family, um, do a career change, things like that. When that happens, they'll ask about us. So they'll lower the barrier to dodginess as we see it because um, the perception is that advice is a dodgy and you guys know it, you cop it as much as we do. Um, so that barrier gets lowered. And then the next question is, so I know they can help, what do they charge? And when your client then says, well, it depends. Um, they charge a fee for the advice that they do, but then sometimes it's offset with an insurance commission and then other times it's not. And I think there's a percentage based on how much super you've got, but then there's like a minimum and a maximum and the client, the prospective client goes, it's all too hard. So the first thing we did <coughs> was break away from a complicated model and just went to a set fee. It's easy to articulate. Um, once we saw that change, the number of referrals that we were getting per client actually went up. The next kicker from there was around the way that we actually um, help the people that are getting referred to us get into actually see us. So we made changes to our meeting structures, um, made it easier for them to understand what the process was in the meeting structures, um, threw out parts that had no value to the client but were probably a legacy or a hang-up of a compliance-driven, old-school, fact-finding type meeting process and just started from scratch and said, put ourselves in our client's shoes. If I, was, if I was a guy like me or a family like me and I wanted to get help from someone like you, how would I want to do it? Um, and so another example in there is we don't do any fact-finding in the first meeting. We barely do traditional fact-finding in the second meeting. Getting a client to sit down and complete a bloody fact find is like 101 to how to not get them to want to come and see you. So um, we're still compliant. We absolutely do everything we need to do. And I'd argue that we, um, Sarah is very responsible for ensuring that we tick every box. Some of them I don't even like. She makes me tick anyway. Um, but I think what we did do is we said, okay, well, how do we, we've got to go customer centric in the way that we've designed these things. Finally, we do incentivize our clients, so we give them gift cards um, with a value of between 50 and 200 bucks, depending on each client, um, and it's the gift card of their choice, and it really depends. <coughs> um, some of our clients don't refer at all, and that's not because they like, hopefully it's not because they don't like what we do. They're just not referrers. It's not their thing. We've got other clients that like literally sit with us in some of their planning meetings or their, one of their quarterly progress meetings and set themselves a target for how many clients they're going to get us in the next 12 months because they figure out five times 200 is a thousand bucks that they get to spend in gift cards. So it's, it's a few steps to, um, to the process uh, and, and that's sort of how we got in there. Yeah, so given, you know, you said you simplify your fees um, and you simplify the process and you incentivize your clients. Do so you think if every advisor watching uh, pretty much did those three things, we'd hit that 98% referral Mark, that you're, you guys are hitting? Or no. is it just because Steve Crawford's such a superstar that we're not going to be able to do that? 
clearly, clearly it's not this guy, right? So it, it's not it's not just about me. There's there's a Crawford factor there. There's, let's be honest. It's a little bit. It's not a lot. There's a little bit. What it is is we've built a model. Um, and look, we, we lose clients. Like I'm not sitting here pretending that we're amazing. We've never lost clients. Everyone's beaten down our door to get in and it's like we're, we're not that, right? So we're clearly fallible. Um, I think what we've done for our cohort, for, that, for, the, for me, for my exes, for Willow and his wives, um, what we've done is we've recognised that the financial services industry en masse is not built for them. The financial planning industry and the mortgage broking industry, arguably even to a lesser degree, en masse is not built for them. It's built out of a retirement planning model, which has evolved into a pre-retirement planning model, which is then flown down into an XY. And so the reason why they come and see us, maybe not at all because we're better at this than anybody else, but at least we've started from the perspective of we're going to build this thing out from where you sit first and foremost and then build a financial planning mortgage breaking business that way rather than coming from the other way, which is how most businesses that are trying to get X's and Y's, they're still trying to retrofit uh, retiree slash pre-retiree model with all the systems infrastructure thinking mindset into an XY model, slap a Facebook page around it, use some cool tech and think that it's going to change it. It's just fundamentally not. If a client comes in when they talk to you and with beyond the first 15 seconds, 15 minutes worth of engagement with amazing tech and all the cool stuff, they'll sit down and go, I want to buy a property and I want to know how much I can afford. If you can't help them, they're gone. Like they're not going to, you're going to go, I can't help you with that, but I'm amazing at superannuation and insurance mm. um, or investments. I can invest the, the wazoo out of everything. And they're sitting there going, great. I've got like 10 grand in cash and 25 grand in my super fund. Have that it, but how are you going to help me? So I, I would argue the reason why we're getting that referral rate, the reason why we're getting that success rate, it's a combination of things, but it's, excuse me, it's absolutely unpinned with a model that, was initially built, continues to evolve, and is always challenged from their perspective, filtered through their eyes. Does it help them get rid of their financial headaches and achieve their goals and teach them how to do it themselves so that they don't have to be beholden and dependent on somebody else? And then cross their fingers and hope that they see the value in coaching, stick around long enough so that Steve can take some of the reliance off Melissa and be able to afford to contribute to the family budget. And keep it. Um, I mean, I've got plenty of questions and I know others do. So remember, when you, if you're watching, just click on that chat button and write your questions. We're going to get to them at the end. So I've got heaps of questions around your fees and compliance. I might just start with a quick yes, no, um, short answer, which I know is going to be hard for you, Steve. Um, but do you think that uh, if we move away from this old way of doing business where it's built around retiree planning um, and focus on Gen Y and Gen X, we need to become self-licensed so we're a bit more, uh, less hamstring around the old school way of thinking about compliance? Um, because you can't mute me because it's going to be bad for your um, bad for your viewers, the answer is uh, it's not a straight yes, no. The answer is no. I actually answered this at the IFA Business Strategy Day where I was on the panel, thanks to the good people at IFA and, and Alex Vikovic, um, go Vico. Uh, and they asked me, look, he put me on the panel for, um, for the same reason, to be confrontational. He asked me the same question. Do they need to be independent financial advisors? Now, right off the top, in case ASIC listening, we are not independent. We have legacy insurance commissions. We get mortgage broking commissions. We are not independent. What we are is the people that own our license is the Crawford family and the Williams family and there's no bank that's aligning in there. The answer that I put to Alex is the same answer that I'll give you guys. If your licensee is stopping you from providing a financial coaching, financial, <coughs> sorry, financial coaching, financial planning, financial advice, business and model that is helping you and your clients get everything you want, if your licensee is stopping you from doing that, then find another licensee or get your own license to be able to do it. If they're not stopping you from doing that, you don't need to go and get your own license. In a perfect world, we probably would have stayed licensed under somebody else. But because of the way we wanted to run our practice, because of the way that the types of clients that we target, 
and a general lack of understanding of what an XY advice model looks like across the Australian financial services industry, we sort of had to go on our own and stop expecting our licensees to understand and build it for us. It's arguably, it's not their job. It's their job to help the majority, not the one noisy, annoying little mob out of Port Melbourne who want to change the world. Mm. I'm, I'm surprised you don't have an affiliate link for the business strategy day, uh, day course. You gave them a big, big You put your love out there. Uh, I didn't get paid anything by, uh, <laughs> by Alex. I, I got paid in ego points. Yeah. <laughs> which, which is more valuable to you than uh, money. You know me well. You know me really well. All right, so we, we don't have heaps of time uh, left for me to ask questions, but I know heaps of people are really interested in your pricing model. Uh, and I know you're pretty open about it. Um, and if not, I'm going to make you op- uh, open up on this interview. But how do you charge clients? Um, and a short answer this time, not not like your last short answer. Uh, how do you charge for clients? Um, and what do you say to the people who say, you know what, uh, you can't charge Gen Y or Gen X fees? Um, okay, so we have a, a two-part fee model, an initial advice fee and an ongoing coaching fee, right? So no, I don't think that's dissimilar to anybody else here. We have an explicit fee for the lifestyle protection and the retirement planning and estate planning piece, which is, in our opinion, almost exclusively relating to getting good superannuation structuring and superannuation advice. Um, and the fee for that for a single to help them set up their lifestyle protection plan, their superannuation strategy, and facilitate the conversations around the estate plan uh, is $1,495 for a single person and sorry, $2,995 one-time only fee for a couple. In almost every scenario that is charged to a superannuation fund where we believe we can meet best interest duty um, and it's in the client's choice. We offer them to be able to pay it out of the back pocket if they want And in some instances they have, but the majority of the time they'll prefer to obviously pay it out of super for cash flow reasons. Um, Goals-based advice, so the goal planning fee is uh, 1995 for singles and 2,995 for couples. And so that's that includes setting up their personal budgeting and cash flow plan or their spending and savings plan, banking structures, strategies towards each of their goals. what most people would call traditional financial planning, right? Um, but with a lot more reverse engineering goals-based advice. Work out what the goal is and then map the plan back to there to get that. Standalone budgeting cash flow, let's call it. That's where everybody sort of gets the same name. Um, 495 for singles, 995 for couples. And that's a one-time only fee to help them set up their banking structure, sorry, their budget, their banking structure, and their reporting templates and layouts. Ongoing, we have a DIY pack, which just um, basically allows them to do their own money management on the platforms that we use, uh, but it's basically an admin fee for us to be able to run the structure that we have, but they do all the work. 22 bucks a month. Um, every time they break something, they have to pay us to fix it, and there's a set fee for that. Every time they want a meeting, they have to pay 220 bucks an hour for the meeting. Then we have two coaching packs. Um, and if anybody wants this stuff, you guys can get their deets to me and I'm happy to share it or I'll put it in the Facey group or whatever. I just wanted Nashi to have a run with his beautiful Pivot Wealth one because it looks it looks so good and it was getting so much love. Before I put mine up there and everybody forgot what his name was, I said that bearded guy from Sydney. Um, uh, virtual coach and personal financial coach and the way that clients choose whether they want to be one or the other. A virtual coach largely acknowledges that they're really good at, they want to make decisions around what they do with their money themselves and that relates to their goals, their super, their insurance, all that stuff. But what they want is someone to tell them how much money they have to be able to make those decisions. So we do that level of virtual coaching. They get a video pack once a quarter from us. They don't get anything else. Um, and they get their, their numbers crunched and we do all of their financial, personal financial reporting. Personal coach is that plus traditional financial planning, unlimited meetings, um, unlimited contact face-to-face go-to meeting or virtual uh, or video packs every quarter plus uh, a traditional annual review and any associated changes. And that is 300 a month for singles, 400 a month for couples for that pack, and the virtual is half, so 150 for singles, 200 for couples. Typically half of the ongoing coaching for personal financial coaching if there's a superannuation element um, related to it, so i.e. they let us do the super stuff for them, the super, the risk, the estate plan, we may charge up to 50% of that fee to 
their um, superannuation fund. But we offset that by reducing all insurance commissions, which reduces any retail premiums that they have by about 25%. Um, and we've done that for the last seven years. You're never going to get so, when, you open, when you ask a question like that. <laughs> and just to, just to clarify, you don't take insurance commissions, and you don't no. take fund, but you do charge mortgage broken commissions. Yeah, that's been a that's been a challenge for us one to to embrace, but it's sort of we're sort of settled that they're clean comms. Um, we asked our aggregator if we could strip out the commission out of the rate and then charge the clients a fee, and they said no. But for a couple of reasons, one, they don't want anybody doing it necessarily because it's too hard for them to, to navigate through and the lenders don't let them do it. So um, we do mortgage broking as basically a loan rider placement. Quite often, because we're charging for that banking and lending structure, um, <coughs> yeah, it's a conflict for us to manage because obviously we get paid if they rewrite a loan. But I would argue probably in about 30% of the cases, we'll keep the clients in their existing lender and implement our structure that way because one, the client doesn't want to move. Two, um, they've got a fixed portion to their loan so that it's not practical um, or for, for some other reason. Yeah. I mean, I guess however you justify it to yourself, as long as you can sleep at night, Steve, that's fine. That's um, right. That's, that's enough questions for me. I'm going to throw it over to Ben. But remember, ask your questions and there's been some questions already. Um, and we're going to get to them after Ben uh, asks some follow-on questions. Over to you, Benny. Thank you, Tomo. And I thought I'd just start with a comment because, Steve, you mentioned that you got these ego points from this uh, from this presentation you did, but I thought that you were already at capacity. Um, <laughs> but any, anyway, that's I suppose that's by the by. Um, first question I just wanted to ask you around this, this, uh, this service package that you mentioned on... Um, the $500, $1,000 goal setting uh, uh, banking uh, package. Can you tell us more more details about how that works? Yes, we call it your money management plan. So this is just the, the $500, $1,000 is the budgeting cash flow one. So basically you, uh, a single person pays 495 bucks and we will have a meeting with them, help them set up their budget, um, help them set up their budget software that they're going to budgeting and reporting software that they're going to use to track, which is either Zero or MoneySoft. Um, we then set up their template banking structure for them. So we help them work out how many spending buckets they need, how many savings buckets they need, how many storage buckets they need. Um, we then help them if they're going to implement that through their existing bank and lender. Obviously, we can't do that because the banks won't work with us. So we'll give them a template that they can use to take to the bank to get that set up themselves. Um, if they want, we can then do an internal referral to Sarah for um, mortgage breaking assistance to see whether or not they want to look at a different lender because their current lender won't implement the structure that we want or they're not happy with the lender. But that's an option. They don't have to do it. It's not part of the, um, it's not forced. Sure. And so do you do that all in the one, you do it all in one meeting? Pretty much, yeah. Like the meeting itself, we call it the, the money management plan meeting, can be done in 60 to 90 minutes tops. Um, and a lot of it is pre-work. So we get the clients to complete a budget planner, um, an asset and liabilities position sort of Excel thing uh, and a bank account structure sheet. So that all comes in as prior to the meeting. And then, then we'll go and actually lock through fixed living expenses, variable living expenses, variable spending figures, savings figure, look at their ratios against how they look compared to our average client because we use our own benchmarks. Um, they'll set their budget for the first three months as their trial budget that they're going to run to. And then, we'll get, then we move to banking structure because you get your banking structure to mirror the budget. So you've got to know how many spending buckets you need and how much goes into it for auto top-ups, how many storage buckets where they park money like holidays and presents to spend later. Um, and we get down to things like, do you want to get an additional card with a pay wave linked to your entertainment family fund? Um, so we, we get fairly involved in that stuff. There's a bit of time. Typically, yeah, singles, 60 to 90 minutes, couples, 90 minutes to two hours to, to get that sorted. And do you do, do you have to do much pre-work before or you just make sure that they've got, they've given you the stuff and you sit down with them and you just work through it all together? Yeah, do you, sorry, do you, off the back of it also, do you ever help them with their banking structure or this is purely if they're going to implement themselves? 
So no, we definitely help them with their banking structure, but only if we're legally allowed to. So banks won't deal with us unless we are the mortgage broker on the on the loans um, and the bank accounts. So where they engage us to do that, and that's part of the service we offer under our mortgage broking side, which is probably a little bit different to a traditional broker. They're very good at getting loans, but they don't do as much on the banking side, whereas for us, banking is more important than loans because banking is what helps them pay their loan off faster and know where their money is. Um, so if we can help them because we've set up the loans, then absolutely. We go to the nth degree of um, working with the branch to actually get all the cards ordered the day when their loans are created, all their sub accounts are created, all the nicknames are created, all the, um, all the transfers are ready to go. Like we do literally as much as we can do without taking over and telling them how to spend money. If they, if they don't get us to help, um, then we give them an idiot's guide to be able to take it to their bank and ask them to do it for them. Sometimes we get them coming back going, the bank won't do it. I just want to move now so that you guys can help me manage that aspect of it. Mm -hmm. And then with that, does that fall under that same package or is that subsidised by the mortgage commissions if you change yeah. their mortgage or do they need to be a client? No, so they don't need to be a client. We do standalone mortgage broking, but it, it, sorry, we offer standalone mortgage broking, but to this day we've had probably only three clients just for mortgage broking. Most of them come in for both. Yeah. Um, uh, and yeah, so no, all of that gets picked up under the broking side because as soon as you start getting into credit world, you just got to make sure you're, um, as advisors, we can give banking structure of advice and lending structure of advice, but we can't talk about setting accounts up and, and different products and stuff like that, which is why we ended up getting our mortgage broking license and Sarah's our mortgage broker, why we got that about 10 months ago. Uh, and do you have then clients that aren't mortgage broking clients that you do cash flow management and, and help them hands on with their banking? Yep. Uh, as, again, as best we can without breaking the rules. Um, like you, it's and it's a challenge, right? Because you can only like, even some clients will go to the extent that they'll go to the bank branch, sit there with their banker, and call us mm. to help them get the structures set up. And some bankers will then play the game and they'll do it. Other ones will go, we can't actually talk while this guy's on the phone because they're not attached to it and it's a breach of blah, 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 which is like playing straight into our hands because at the end of the day, what the client wants is a setup that makes it easy for them to do what they want to do. And if the bank won't facilitate that um, because they won't work with someone that's helping them, then they'll go to another bank that will. Yeah. Okay. And, and does that service then feed into your other, obviously it feeds into the mortgage broking side of things, but do you, do you then sort of transition clients through to, to more coaching or what do you find is the take up of that and that transitioning into one of the other packages? Yeah, it's really life, it's, it's sort of two things. It's life stage dependent and it's, it's more around the mentality of, of what role they want a coach to play in their life. So life stage dependent is basically saying anyone that's younger that has is just them, um, has a goal, typically save money to get a property. Um, they might take up our money management plan and our risk and super plan and then do the virtual coaching pack, which because it's only then 150 bucks a month for them. And if they're getting us to do their super stuff, they can and get an ongoing superannuation and insurance review. We sort of divide that annual review cost into part of the monthly fee. So they'll pay like 75 bucks a month out of their back pocket, 75 bucks a month out of their super fund. Um, the younger ones will go, that's for now, that's all I need. And the hope is obviously that they can progressively purchase up to the full coaching pack because that's what we want, right? Because ultimately the clients that have the full coaching pack get the best savings results. Um, they're the most engaged. They, pay, they give us the highest number of referrals and we make the most amount of money um, from it. It doesn't always work like that. We've had some that it's sort of we've got quite a few that are still in the middle. Um, I think the main point is you give them a, you give them a way to be able to choose to go up and go down. Okay. And so, do you do the, you find that these people when they take up that initial package that they sometimes they just sit dormant and then they come back um, when they're ready to transition up? Does that actually happen, or is my experience when you leave clients alone they tend to not do the, the things that they need or want to do. Yeah, so it's in the it's it's more in the ongoing. So the ones that so we've got a DIY, which is the twenty two buck a month, basically, they're the clients that are 
in their own eyes, completely self-sufficient. The only thing they lack is a financial reporting tool to be able to see what they've got. So that, and, they, and then they'll learn how to use it themselves, right? And that's probably been like five clients since we launched the thing about 12 months ago. Um, those ones don't come back. Invariably, most of them cancel out because they realise it's all too hard and they can't even do the work. The ones that are sitting in the middle, which is where most of it, or 50% of probably our last 12 months worth of clients are sitting, um, we've seen a lot of them actually go up. Probably I'd say about a quarter of those because they just realise that even though we're giving them all the information, the analogy I use is like, in an AFL game, it's quarter time and you've got coaches everywhere and then you've got a couple of players that are sitting off on the side and their coach comes down and goes, here's your video of what you did really well, what you did wrong and what you need to improve on. Good luck for the rest of the game and we'll see you at half time. But when you can't ask questions, it's literally, here's the information you make decisions. And then there's people sitting over there with a the coaching team that are saying, okay, there's your video plus, these are the other things that you need to do to get better. Um, typically what we find is people get to a crossroad there where they go, um, I'm okay doing it <coughs> myself, excuse me, but what we're hoping is most of them go, you know what, I'd actually prefer to get some feedback around how do I get better? What, well, I've got my savings figure coming through now. What do I do with it? So um, it's really built to be like a, a middle ground for people that are undecided as to whether they want to do it themselves or do it with a coach. We don't see it as a long-term home. It's really yeah. to place to enter and then go up or out. And the hope is obviously they go up, which we're seeing so far. But it's only that one's only been going for about twelve months. Okay. And where do people typically start? Do they do they normally jump in at, at, at you know different different points, or what's the most popular uh, yeah service package that people engage yeah. with? So singles typically the most popular one is uh, younger singles, no kids is money management with the risk and super and then the middle virtual pack um, couples with uh, that have got a lot of crap going on getting married buying properties starting families will go to the full coach pack full support pack um, and that's the predominant mix of who we've got we do have some uh, school age parents who i take on as well uh, and they tend to sit at the upper end as well so really it's sort of people that are either getting at the, the starting out phase, they need a plan to help them manage their money. They go, they get the risk and super because, one, it covers their backside because they understand their income is the single biggest driver of their success, so they want to protect that. Um, and then, uh, and then two, you know, trauma and stuff like that's really important to them. Um, blatant product flog, we're massive fans of using AIA and Vitality. I am in the AIA office and I am married to somebody at AIA, but... <laughs> Been a, look, it's been a, for a business that charges fees and doesn't take commission on risk. You've got to question why we're so passionate about this stuff because clearly for us, we don't make extra money from recommending them. The reason why we're passionate about this is because it enables them and, to understand and engage in their insurance where before all they saw it was punishment money that they had to pay every month. Now they're actively involved in it. So that's another demonstration of, of how we've changed things. And couples, yeah, typically the whole thing. Yeah, awesome. No, we, we also love uh, AIA and uh, thanks for their support of XY Live, of course, as always. Um, one of the things, just before I get to questions, and I can see there's a bunch of questions coming in from everyone watching. Uh, if anybody else does have questions, feel free to type them in the chat box and we're going to get to them in just a sec. But I just wanted to ask you on one of the things you mentioned before on your uh, referral fees that you pay to clients. Do you feel um, like that that paying them a fee that it that is it's a it's like a, a complicating factor, I suppose, or that it devalues the service because like they pay you a fee and then you pay them a fee? Like, do you ever have uh, conversations with that around clients or have it received you know well poorly, etc.? Um, we've never had it received poorly. Um, yeah. We've, we've, it's, look, it's not a deal breaker. Um, I think we get referrals, we would get referrals without it. What it is for us is it's recognition that, the, and this is part of the reason why our business is heading down the, the path that it is heading down with developing the coaching side, um, is we want to have a high touch, high relationship, high involvement, high value with a small number of clients. 
So we don't want to have 500 plus. Um, and I know that might be contrary to where a lot of businesses are heading these days. We want sort of work to the basis there. Where I have like 50 clients and I'm nearly there. And then Willow has like 100 clients because we'll do the grunt work. Um, and, and the way that we get those clients is through referrals. So we don't spend money on marketing and advertising, but we want to grow our business. So what we're doing is redirecting our marketing and advertising budget back into the people that are helping us grow the business. And we just thank them for, for being our advocates. And, you know, they don't need to take the gift card if they don't want to do it. They can on-gift it, re-gift it. Tomo loves re-gifting stuff. I've heard that about him. Um, uh, best way to keep your Christmas budget spends down. Uh, but what it, what, it, what it does do, I think, in, in at least a small way, hopefully, is recognises that they're a valuable part of the growth of, of our business because they love us enough to, to refer friends and family um, to, to help them out with the stuff that's pretty personal um, around their world, like buying properties and starting families and schooling their kids and stuff like that. So no, no negatives at all, mate, only positives. Cool. Okay, and a follow-up on that one. This is uh, from, from Dylan. Um, he's, he's asked how successful that's, that's been um, and, and, you know, what... What uh, advice would you give somebody that was thinking of going down that path of incentivizing their clients to refer? Uh, know your clients. So yes, it's been successful. No, it needs to be enough to, for them to, to, if you really want to get good referrals, um, some of them are driven by it. Not everybody's going to want to refer. So it's sort of go to, go to your guns. We've got a lot of financial services clients and a lot of them are sales based people and they love targets. So we sit with them and help them give themselves a target of how many people they're going to grow um, our business by. And it's still got to be the right people, right? So we're not, we're very exclusive in a, in a sense of who we work with. We don't deal with olds um, and we don't deal with people that are going to basically kick our heads in and, and try and get us to validate every idea that they've got um, because we only want to have like 150 odd that we look after. Um, so if it's, if it's, if your demographic works, I'd say it works really well with the Ys, not as much with the Xs. If I had three retiree clients, I probably wouldn't do it because I just don't think that's them. For them, it's more about quality and, and all that sort of stuff. But the Ys, you know, Tom and flogged me about the affiliate stuff. It's part and parcel. Like these days, it's I want to get something out of my relationship. They love rewards points. They love you know, again, vitality with the, the gift cards and the juice juices. And it's just another demonstration of I want to be involved as like a semi-partner with the businesses that I work with and, and help me find a way that I can help you and help myself at the same time. Yeah, no, that's, uh, yeah, that makes sense. I know I'm, me and a good mate of mine, we do Amex rewards points and we're like in competition how many referrals we can get um, just to get people on Amex. I've got a little bit of a, I need to like calm down a bit because I'm a financial advisor and that kind of, you know, messes that up a little bit. Um, so I make sure I, you know, give everyone a disclosure that I'm not giving them advice. But yeah, I agree. Uh, you know, giving them an incentive to refer isn't necessarily a bad thing. We've got a question from Dylan and I know Steve, you like to waffle on. So let's keep these audience questions short, sharp. Um, but Dylan's also asked about uh, like one-off coaching and consulting and how do you go between like giving, is it general advice, is it personal advice? And if you do it, uh, no, we don't do one-off coaching and consulting for consumers. We do it on the on the coaching side with other advisors and mortgage brokers, but not on consumer stuff. Because um, at the end of the day, it's either it's either general advice or it's personal advice. So our, our fees, our packages are our packages. They either get help with the stuff that we're good at helping people with because that's what they look like and that's what they want, or we politely offer to find help them find somebody else to do it for them. Short enough? Very short. Thanks, mate. Uh, got a question here for, again from Dylan, just about what your fat fine looks like, high level. It looks like a bog standard financial services fat fine. Um, okay. But the, the difference is it gets, it gets filled in from where we capture information in different sources. It gets pre-populated with all the information as we're capturing it through the different meeting stages. And then it gets sent to the client via DocuSign to validate all the information and they, they DocuSign it rather than sitting down and filling out crap themselves. 
Because we're mm. like you guys know, we we get the answers to most of these questions anyway through all the other stuff that we've got to get. We'll fill it out and then send it to them completed to sign off. Great. So next question is from Amanda Pond, and she's asked about uh, how do you feel about referring to property buyers agents? Uh, you said you know a lot of what you do is around property, whether it be for the home or investment. Um, so do you guys actively refer to buyers agents? Uh, we do. We've got a client who owns a big property advisory, property valuations business, and so we've been working with him on um, developing out offers over and above like the full cans, right? So a 2.2% model and a, and a bog standard value. Not a lot of value in either way for our clients because they're spending half a mil and I want to drop 11 grand on finding a property. So what we've said is, one, no comms, it's got to be a flat fee. Two, start to build out offers for us that actually help them. So they might have a list of 10 properties, give it a star rating between one to five. Um, and this is the WBP property guys. I'm, I don't get any kickbacks from them. I'm referring through because they're, they're good at what they do. If you want to, you want to stress test them, stress test them. I promise. But it's um, look. There's a lot of buyers advocates that I wouldn't send my clients anywhere near, um, and that's because they're glorified real estate agents that are getting clips left, right, and centre. They're lining up sellers and buyers, and they're dodgy as the day is long. Right. So um, this is a because you just don't want your clients getting making a terrible decision in this space. So finding one that's good is important. We've done the stress testing with these guys to make sure that we know that they are good. Um, but you have the same list of questions. Do you line up sellers and buyers? Are you getting a clip on both sides or just one side? Can we do a flat dollar fee? Do you have anything other than a full buyer's advocate offer where we can maybe do like, is my property investment grade or stuff like that? Push them to challenge them to build an offer that suits you and your client base. Um, and if they don't, go and find somebody that will because there are ones out there that will. Not just ours, but other ones that are out there as well. Cool. Got another question here from uh, from Ross. Uh, he, and he's asking about how you how you attracted clients when you first launched the business. You said you started from zero. So, uh, yeah, how did you how did you start? I... I uh, Grafted, I corrupted about uh, 40 of my mates, convinced my mates, about 40 of my mates to come and have a beer with me down in Docklands at a pub. And then I begged five of the 40 to come on board as clients so I didn't have to go with my tail between my legs back to corporate. Um, with a promise and, a, uh, and an intent to roll up my sleeves and work really hard. And fortunately, I managed to bag five um, and those five preferred five and then it's sort of been onwards and upwards from there. So uh, that's how I kicked off. So start by begging. I love it. So next question is from Stuart Barber. Um, what, what's your revenue split between mortgage broking and financial planning? Yeah, so broking's still, sorry, broking's still really in its, in its infancy. We've got three revenue lines. We've got the coaching side, we've got the planning side, and we've got the mortgage broking side. Um, so off the top of my head, the split this financial year, uh, last financial year, we, were, we literally just launched broking, so it was stuff all. Um, this financial year, it'll probably be about 10% of our revenue from broking, about 25% uh, from coaching and the remainder from planning. But our intention is to build the broking, build the coaching, and then hold planning and grow planning as it is. Cool. And what proportion of revenue do you think will come from affiliate marketing? Probably about zero point one percent of of, of um, dollar based revenue. Um, about ten percent of my happiness of annoying Tomo by plugging stuff uh, that that is just left of centre will probably feel about sixty percent my happiness. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Uh, good to clarify that one. And I've got a question. Uh, from Mark talking about the the fees and he says that your fees are they seem a little on the low side for the for your clients and, and it is quite a high touch. Um, what what do you target for total revenue per client and do you find, you know, have you I uh, suppose to add on that, have you done metrics around, you know, time spent, time money generated and what the profitability of providing services at that level is? Yeah, so we've, uh, you're right, the fees are low relative to the industry, but they're high relative to the perception of value of what financial planners are worth. 
So if you look at the ING direct research around what Gen X and Gen Y are willing to pay for advice, it's like 500 bucks. So uh, our top fee for couples is six grand. So we're 12 times the expectation of value. Um, I know because I've trained some advisors, um, I know that some advisors literally do exactly what we do and charge nearly double. Uh, so so there's, there's bookends, right? And, and now our opinion, you start with the client's expectation and then you go up and then do it in a way where it, it jumps the hurdle um, from a, a cost point of view, but then you redefine how you get profit. Profit for us is lifetime client. Um, referrals, we don't try and make an enormous amount of money in the setup fee. We're trying to get lifetime client profit um, on the ongoing fee and not have to spend money on marketing to grow our business through the referral stuff. So we've deliberately structured it that way. Um, the main growth avenue for our broader church business will be the coaching side over the next five years where we launch a series of online courses and then hopefully roll them out through Australia and, and across the States. And, and that's where we'll make more money because we can leverage our IP. Um, I don't think planning the way that we do it is scalable to be 200 clients per coach. It's just not. You're just not going to get a good enough result from a client point of view. You're not going to add enough value. Um, and so for us, it makes sense. Um, there are ways to do like that middle package. Probably you could run 200, 250 clients because literally all you're doing is crunching numbers for them and sending them videos out, which take about 10 minutes to produce. Um, you could definitely um, have a much higher volume of clients there. Awesome. Thanks, Steve. Um, I know there's going to be more questions after this and we'll move them to the Facebook group. If you're not already involved in the Facebook group, you've got to click on xyadvisor.com slash community, fill out a quick form, agree to not um, flog products, uh, not, um, you know, steal anyone else's IP. And I know Steve's going to jump on straight away after this and share his pricing um, model. Um, but before we go, Steve, I've just got one last question. Um, you know, random question. What type of conferences are you planning on going to this year? Yeah, it's a good question, Tomo. Um, look, where our, the, the XY, uh, sorry, the Experience World crew will be heading offshore to, to the States to go to, to FinCon in October. But we've got a limited spend on how much we can invest in our team um, at conferences and the best development for our team and our business for where we're at, we think we sort of tapped out of how much value we can derive from um, traditional Australian-based conferences. Uh, we want to learn different ways, this, but primarily driven because of the coaching stuff, right? So if I was a new advisor and I needed to learn my craft, um, I'm definitely going to an AFA conference or an FPA or one of the industry ones or a licensee one. But I think when you're... It's going to come across as arrogant, which is going to be no shock to you. But when you're at the top of your game uh, and people are now asking you how to do stuff, you've got to go and learn from other people that are better at it than you. And we don't need to learn how to be better at advice. We're, we're good at that. We need to learn how to be better at growing our business in different ways. And because the coaching side is such a big focus for us, the answer for that is in the States. And so... We're heading over with, uh, with a few other advisors that may or may not be on this call as well um, because I just think you, you, where else do you go to learn how to go big, go hard or go home than uh, in Dallas, Texas in October at FinCon. Yeah, so just just quickly, we're well over time. Um, so I apologise to everyone's viewing and thought it was only going to be 45 minutes max, but I try to cut Steve down uh, with his answers. But give us a quick rundown of what XY Academy is um, and why you stole XY Advisor's name. One, I've, I've got a, a, an age complex that I'm going to be out of the Y side of it and, and you just won't let me hang out with the kids anymore. Two, um, the reason why we're launching XY Academy is... Um, one, I love coaching other businesses. It's, it's my absolute passion. I do. I love having a financial planning business and mortgage breaking business that helps other X Y clients. But my what gets me out of bed in the morning is business to business coaching at financial advisors and mortgage brokers. Um, we're probably the only one of a few exclusive X Y businesses in the country. We're definitely one of the a handful that have developed an offer from scratch and that have. Um, been successful at getting people to come on board in a non-traditional sense. So what we're launching in XY Academy is um, 
basically a step-by-step how-to guide on how to build a XY financial advice offer. So everything from all the stuff that we've talked about today in a lot more detail. Like I barely touched on our goals-based process. Um, I barely touched on any of our action plan processes, how to run a quarterly progress meeting, um, all of the other stuff that we just sort of take for granted because it's what we do day in, day out. Other planners and, and mortgage brokers, to a lesser degree, are asking us, how do you do that? Um, and no one else is going to teach them. So the hope for us is that if we build it in a way where it's valuable for you guys and we uh, can offer it at a price point that is fair and reasonable, um, then you might ask us to, to, to get on board. But we're not ready yet. We're probably still about four months away from, three months away from having the, X, uh, the XY Academy one ready. Um, the budgeting and cash flow stuff, your spending coach is ready and we have a workshop on the 21st and 22nd of March to, um, to help anybody out in the budgeting and cash flow space. Last okay, month. that's enough. Enough flogging your wares. Uh, well done, Steve. Thank you very much for joining us. And also, just a mat. I know Steve's already given AIA a massive plug, but we just uh, really appreciate uh, the support from AIA uh, for making XY Life happen. So thank you very much, Steve. Uh, and if anyone's got any questions for Steve, follow up in the Facebook group. Um, so we'll see you there. And next week, we're doing something a bit different with XY Life. We're going to do a forum. So uh, the people who kind of make XY happen, we're going to be discussing uh, a topic of going beyond the SOA. Um, so it'll be a bit of an experiment from XY Live, uh, but make sure you register um, that we've already just put out in the chat box. So register, and I'll see you all next week. Thanks again, Steve. Thanks, Steve.